this session goes from some of the bigger ideas we've talked about globally um, and also focused specifically on Japan to looking in a distinctly regional context. We're focusing on the Indo-Pacific and what, specifically in terms of trade, um, the evolution of trade in the region um, as well as the status of trade because I think um, trade is not something that um, business people typically necessarily have a, a very strong um, connection with unless they're specifically connected to export oriented businesses and as we've heard already today there needs to be a focus on building export oriented businesses not just unicorns without revenue and also looking at what those uh, opportunities might be across across the uh, industry landscape one of the things that was also brought up earlier in the in the day was around the global south um, as a concept um, but I think we need to sort of keep an open mind as to uh, when we're talking about the Indo-Pacific. The Global South is a very um, popular term when it comes to discussions at the World Economic Forum and also at the G7 that was in Hiroshima earlier this year. Um, but the Indo-Pacific is really, it's about the geographical region itself and, and that's really the focus of our um, conversation today. So we'll look at um, some of the issues around strategic realignments that have gone on post-COVID, um, new ideas um, in terms of uh, economic uh, resilience rather than just economic efficiency, um, values in trade, um, and the role of technology as well. And I'll, I'll now turn to um, Dr. Parag Khanna to really give us a bit of a, a geopolitical um, context to some of the discussion we're going to have here today on trade. And if you'd like to uh, begin, Parag, on your, your thoughts on the, on the context for trade. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anton. Pleasure to be with you all today. Sorry that I can't actually be there in person, uh, though I was in Japan briefly last week. And uh, as as ever, it defies uh, conventional, you know, Western or or, or external views uh, that are relatively critical, you know, about the state of its uh, demographics, economic momentum, social vitality, and so forth. You actually find. In Japan, for all of all of us who do travel there, uh, that it is uh, you know as vibrant as ever in so many exciting ways. So uh, apologies that I can't be there in person, but certainly there in in spirit. Now I do think that trade is as geopolitical now as it has, of course, been in many many decades, and that therefore makes the geopolitical angle on trade uh, very very significant for us to be looking at. Uh, first and foremost, let's remember that since uh, over the past thirty years, really since the end of the the Cold War collapse of the Soviet Union, Asia as a whole has experienced a very rapid trade convergence. The total volume of intra-Asian trade exceeds uh, Asian trade with the rest of the world. That's a very significant accomplishment. And this geoeconomic trade convergence is occurring despite rising geopolitical tensions, as we of course see between China and its uh, neighbors, uh, as well as China and Japan and so forth, tensions in the South China Sea and so forth. Um, interestingly, I'll just make a point that the very definition of Asia is evolving because so vast and deep have Asia's trade relations become that the so-called Middle Eastern countries are really West Asia, right? You can see this in their trade and investment patterns. You can also see, of course, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that Russia is very dependent now on China, on India, on trade and investment from Asian partners who have not, quote unquote, abandoned it or sanctioned it the way Western countries have. In fact, Asian countries have, um, have you know, almost gone out of their way in some ways to accommodate Russia while not embracing it. Uh, but clearly they're being opportunistic, so much so that the future of Russia seems to me to be North Asia, you might even say, as the map behind me, in fact, uh, notably indicates from a geographical point of view, Russia is, of course, North Asia. We just don't tend to think of it that way, but we will in the future. So you have a region rife in geopolitical tensions that are being exacerbated, but you still have this accelerating geoeconomic and trade convergence. Now, Anton mentioned earlier, Japan and startups and unicorns. But let's also bear in mind that Japan Inc., the traditional multinational industries, the conglomerates of the Japanese economy that are its anchors, uh, are quite dependent 
on exports as well. In fact, uh, Japanese exports to uh, China have a material impact on uh, the country's uh, economic vitality and even GDP. So Japan is very, very, very deeply integrated in the region. And I would give Japan credit for being one of the real driving forces behind the rise of what I consider to be the fourth wave of Asian growth. Japan is itself the first wave in the post-war decades. Then came the tiger economies. Then came China itself. And now you have South and Southeast Asia, this contiguous region of 2.5 billion people. And it is Japan, followed by the tigers, followed by China, that have been among the leading investors and trade partners of these countries and really helping to accelerate their rise. And you can see this with Japanese firms um, and Korean firms, uh, mm -hmm. Singaporean firms that have increased their exposure in Thailand, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, and in India. And so again, the earlier waves of Asian growth, the wealthy countries, the mature countries, the aging societies with the most complex economic systems have been exporting their technology and know-how and establishing special economic zones and value-added supply chain activity uh, across the developing younger, poorer, less complex economies. And that's a very positive cycle that's expanding the overall Asian economic uh, geography, GDP, and the overall convergence uh, in the region. Now, a final geopolitical point that's important is that, of course, Whereas many people talk about decoupling and de-risking uh, in the world economy, let's be clear, the correct word for it is diversification, right? Because when you use the word decoupling, it makes it seem like we are deglobalizing. That is not true. What you see, in fact, is that Chinese trade with ASEAN is increasing as a result of its desire to use those countries that are lower cost in manufacturing as the export hubs for TPP related trade, for example. So you actually see an increase in overall trade. You just see its diversification outside of just China. So let's be very, very clear that decoupling or de-risking from China does not mean deglobalization. It actually means an even more complex globalization than what we had before. And so that becomes another part, uh, another geopolitical dimension of the trade story. But there's no question that Asian economies as a whole <clears throat> have embraced globalization. You do not see the kind of protectionist uh, anti-trade movements in Asia the way you see in other parts of the world. They're simply, they're practicing an open regionalism. RCEP is the largest uh, regional trade agreement in the world, TPP, which most countries in the region have uh, subscribed to and so forth. So I think that you know the future of, uh, of trade in the region is very bright but it becomes more complicated due to the geopolitical uh, tensions, industrial policies, and so forth. But quite frankly, industrial policies are nothing new to Asia, of course. It's been uh, decades in the making, seeking to have or augment or underscore the competitive advantage that national economies have, and allowing certain exemptions at the national level for protected sectors, for industry, for national champions, is part of what has actually preserved the political momentum and support for uh, uh, more open trade uh, in the region. So overall, despite the geopolitical tensions that are present and the dangers that they pose to certain supply chains, to certain bilateral relationships, to certain dyads of trade, the overall picture is one in which uh, supply and demand are both uh, increasing and the complementarities and diversity, uh, diversification of those trade complementarities uh, continues to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Parag. And so it sounds like we're not seeing what the media are telling us about a backwards picture on globalization necessarily or trade, but we're seeing a, a sort of a more, more complex process developing and there's maybe a, a generative um, process that's going on here with more nuanced sophistication. Um, Yoshida-san, um, maybe you can tell us a bit about Japan's perspective on trade, I mean, as well as your current um, director general role with the uh, Trade Policy Bureau, you were previously um, head of the negotiations for Japan on RCEP. Um, that's one of the um, agreements. There's also um, the newer version of the TPP, I guess. Um, but, but if you can perhaps tell us um, Japan's perspective on, on trade and, and the Indo-Pacific region, that'd be great. Um, thank you, Anton. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer, Anton, 
for having me uh, on the panel. And I also like to mention that uh, the views expressed at this uh, panel is uh, my own, not uh, necessary that those of uh, uh, the you know, organizations I'm affiliated with. Having said that, I would like to uh, mention three dimensions of uh, Japanese trade policy. Is that okay? Could you? All right. Okay. First, um, Japan is um, pursuing the uh, free and open route based trading system in the region. Um, we need to, you know, uh, make WTO refunction again in three uh, functions, uh, rule making and dispute settlement and monitoring. Those three functions are weakened uh, significantly in recent years. We need to revitalize uh, WTO as much as possible. And at the same time in the region, we are promoting um, regional uh, uh, free trade agreement or the economic partnership agreement so that we could have more uh, freer and opener uh, trade in the region. And we would like, we also uh, make us able to have uh, more uh, deepened loose, uh, not only the border related issue, but also many other uh, important issues in terms of the uh, trading issues. Um, and the, um, the second dimension is to pursue the uh, initiatives among uh, like-minded countries. We need to uh, have broader and deeper and higher standard of uh, loose, trading loose, uh, so that uh, uh, you know, this is exemplified by the uh, initiatives of uh, CPTPP. We have higher loose, on uh, many issues and new rules on uh, new issues like uh, digital trade and others so that we could have uh, you know, freer and an opener uh, trade, trade in the region. And also uh, we would like to you know, reinforce or um, to have uh, more and more resilience in the uh, economy. We need to strengthen the uh, you know, uh, supply chain resilience in face of um, many issues like uh, you know, economic coercion as well as natural disasters. So uh, we uh, value very much uh, with uh, the uh, uh, like-minded countries to cope with us and pursuing those uh, you know, important uh, trading initiatives. And the uh, third dimension is more uh, uh, topic uh, based, but uh, uh, in, in view of the more and more integrated globalized economy, we need to uh, think more about uh, uh, important issues like uh, human rights and environment and digital, something like that, so that uh, we are uh, promoting uh, uh, those uh, you know, values when we think about uh, trade. For example, the human rights, uh, Japanese companies are keen on, uh, more and more keen on uh, you know, protecting the human rights in their supply chain. It does not confine within their own companies or subsidiaries activities. They need to talk about upstream and downstream to think about the whole supply chain to be um, free from violation of uh, human rights so that uh, this is an uh, increasingly important topic for Japanese companies. So we, we are encouraging uh, trading partners in the region to think more thoroughly about uh, this issue. Those are the uh, dimensions we are thinking about uh, uh, in promoting a trading agenda in the region. Thanks. Thank you, Yoshida-san. Now, we, we, we can come back to some of the discussion on, on trade agreements, and we've got another um, very experienced um, trade expert um, from Australia in the room today. But let's, let's go to Marcella um, now, who can go a bit deeper on the digital side and the technology side, and also give us a picture of um, Indonesia. I think 
one of the reasons the Global South was talked about is that there's perhaps not a lot, not as much awareness of um, some of the countries of the Global South or, in fact, um, the Indo-Pacific region either. And I think if we, if we can hear from Marcella your thoughts on uh, what we need to know to understand about Indonesia and also if you can give us a, an update on the technology front um, for the business environment in Indonesia too, that would be great. Thank you, so yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Anton. Um, well, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for the committee and also for Anton to for inviting me uh, to this event. It's really uh, an honor to me to speak in this event. Well, it's really interesting uh, questions yeah, to to give a perspective about the the uh, what what is about the digital adoptions in Indonesia and digital advancements in uh, Indonesia. But then before I go there, I think it's it's good to understand uh, if we talk about um, tech in Indonesia, it's highly correlated with the populations. <laughs> As you know, we have 270 million people. But the most interesting thing is that um, Indonesia is home to 135 million people under 35. So almost 60% of our populations are young. So I think Indonesia is one of the one of the biggest young populations in the world. So when you have 60% of your populations are young, then what does it mean for the country? What does it mean uh, for the economy? Definitely young population. Uh, drive um, digital penetrations, digital adoptions. We are one of the mobile first country. Everyone in Indonesia has a phone, uh, mobile phone. Even statistically, uh, the number of mobile connectivity uh, is greater than the populations, meaning one person can have one more than two phone numbers, especially in cities. Um, and those digital penetrations uh, rate will drive a innovations in technology, of course, because digital penetration changes the way, the way people demand for good and services. It changes the way people, the willingness people to pay for demand and services. And also it changes the connectivity between cities and areas, because we're Indonesia is consists of seventeen thousand islands. So technology really drive innovations and create an opportunity for for startup tech. In fact, we have like around two hundred, two hundred, two thousand and seven. I think it's around two thousand tech startup. Just second to, uh, second to India. And if you see Indonesia, cities in Indonesia are vibrant, move fast. People are, are um, and even if the if you go to the, to the, to the slightly rural area, you can see like farmers, fishermen, they have their mobile phone. They do transactions. They put order. They put their product in a marketplace where people from across the island can order their produce. Startup in Indonesia, uh, I think among those um, 2000 startup, uh, they're ranging from right hailing to aquaculture tech, from digital payments to B2B services. Some of them are, are simple things like uh, solutions for ordering in restaurants things like that are really happening. If you sit in restaurant in in even small city in Indonesia, you can see you can see how technology are there helping their businesses, helping helping the merchants to inventor to do the inventory to to do the calculations, to do the finance reporting things. So those kind of fact uh, vibrant things why having young populations are, are really important 
to to this country and also to these regions how young populations drives so many um so many innovations uh change the way people transact change change the way people trade and change uh, the way uh, people um people people conduct their day-to-day -day activities um, and every day Marcella, you were, you were mentioning to me a couple of things that the Indonesian government's doing to help accelerate this um, digital economy and digital processes. Do you mind listing what, what a couple of those are in terms of the acceleration of tech, the technology industries in Indonesia? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yes. Um, well, the populations, the young populations that spread across the country uh, are uh, give us opportunity, but also in the government eyes, I think it's also provide challenge that they need to tackle. One of the key that government and also businesses want to achieve in Indonesia is that uh, no one left behind, that these technology adoptions are spread equally uh, across islands, not just, so the technology, the benefit of technology and economic growth is not, not not being enjoyed by those those live in the city, but also in a rural area. So I think government are trying to solve that problem statement into some regulations that make sure that no one left behind. We seem to just have disconnected briefly from Marcella. Maybe in terms of, um, are we connecting back? No, maybe we'll, we'll pick up with Marcella um, on on the on on the value side, she's back. Okay, please continue, Marcella. We just lost you for a few seconds. Oh, okay, okay. Can I can can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Or okay, so I think the current um, the current regulations that government launch is the e-commerce regulations. Um, I think Indonesia government has been very supportive of the uh, e-commerce sectors. Um, the government is definitely recognizing uh, it, its uh, significant potential for economic growth. Um, so uh, the current policies have been aimed to promoting online businesses, improving logistics and payments, and also provide the same level playing field between e-commerce and social commerce. I think, I think you may heard that. Oh, there is, there are some social commerce are banned in Indonesia, but in actually, no, they're not banned. It was just the regulation is to regulate between e-commerce and social commerce, uh, and those, um, these regulations is 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 is, I think I think the government wants to wants to provide a same level playing field and also to protect consumer data, and also to make sure that consumer transacts uh, securely and. In, in a platform that that is being regulated, is the, uh, Marcelo, is 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 the is the, is the government trying to encourage some of these businesses to export across the region, um, in terms of increasing um, Indonesia's export trade? Is that yes, part of the that's that's definitely that's that's one of the own that no one left behind, and also we I think what Indonesia want business and government are trying to be an active players in the regions we are not just the market but we also want to produce and 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 also uh, in a trade we want to to export and also to import we're receiving but also we're we want to sending and uh and, and playing a bigger role in the regions thank thank you very much Marcel. i think it's a really helpful picture in terms of what's happening um in the industry um and, and the approach to as you say, not leaving anyone behind by the government in Indonesia. Um, just in terms of um, what uh, Yoshida-san was talking about in terms of um, this, this idea of like-minded nations, um, you know, banding together on initiatives, I'd now like to ask um, Peter his thoughts on uh, one of the ideas around climate change and, you know, what we have as the energy transition, in particular uh, green technology and how um, trade might assist and facilitate the um, adaption and um, production of green technology across the region. Over to you, Peter. Uh, thanks, Anton. It's great to be here. And uh, Yoshida-san was very wise with his caveats on the, in the capacity that he's speaking here, so I'll echo those myself. Um, but yes, I mean, I think this is, the next, this is the next great disruption. And of course, trade is going to be at the centre of how we, how, we, how we handle it. For 
Australia and Japan, it's, it's an interesting metaphor, perhaps. Uh, uh, Australia and Japan are the closest energy partners. Um, last year, a third of Japan's energy um, elect for electricity generation came from Australia, including around 45% of Japan's LNG. Uh, it's Australia's biggest energy market with $80 billion last year. Uh, and Japanese investment has been huge into Australia in driving not just those industries, um, but uh, uh, you know the domestic arrangements in Australia. Uh, so it's hugely significant to both of our countries. Um, and I don't want to be dismissive to say that it was somewhat easy in the past, because it's not. It's very difficult to do these things well. It's actually very difficult to export energy and to develop the technology. So, um, but it, from a policy's point of view, it was somewhat simple in the past. Japanese investment drove great uh, progress in Australia. Australian exports provided energy security for, for Japan. Uh, but now, as we all are moving uh, to, on a decarbonisation pathway, things are getting much more complicated. And that's where we have to uh, really work together, together closely. Um, so uh, we actually had Minister Nishimura, the METI minister, in Australia yesterday. Uh, he met uh, three different Australian ministers to talk about uh, energy and other issues. And of course, Australia uh, re uh, provided assurances on the stable supply of traditional energy. But we're also talking a lot more about what we do on the decarbonisation pathway. Because in the past, some of these investments were very natural uh, and obvious. Now we have to all wrestle with emerging technologies, technologies we don't know which technologies will, will, will succeed. And so there's actually going to be a bigger role uh, for governments in working uh, with the private sector in supporting um, arrangements for all of the new sort of technologies that we're going to, going to supply. Part of that, of course, is you know, the work Japan Japanese government is doing a lot to provide support for potential hydrogen um, trade in the future, just like Australian government as well. Uh, but also things like critical minerals, critical, critical tech, where we have to actually create new supply chains and create those resilient, as uh, Dr. Parang said, resilient, diverse supply chains as well. So uh, this is the big new frontier, I think, in trade um, and uh, an exciting time for everybody. Thank you, Peter. Um, Parag, you've, you've written extensively on climate change and its, its effects in terms of population migration. What's, what's your view in terms of how climate change policies and, and the attendant um, ways to um, mitigate and adapt to climate change, how, how's, how's that going to play out in your mind in terms of regional dynamics, trade and um, prosperity? I think it's a, it's a great question, a very existential one and, and important to be talking about with the COP28 summit uh, kicking off in just a few weeks uh, in Dubai. Now, first of all, we've had 27 COP summits by my count and uh, clearly summitry alone has failed to mitigate uh, climate change, which is continues to accelerate. And therefore, we do have to focus more and more on adaptation, not just mitigation. Mitigation means decarbonization, net zero, greening of supply chains and industries. And all of that is very important and noble. And I think a lot of effort is, and capital is going into it, and that's fine. But adaptation is just as important because we are feeling the effects in an accelerating way of climate change on uh, on our geographies, on our societies and industries, infrastructure, economies all over the world. And that applies in spades to Asia. Asia is the most exposed region to climate effects in terms of the number of people, of course, because Asia has the most people and the number of people exposed to rising sea levels, typhoons, hurricanes, floods, heat waves, droughts. For every single climate peril, Asia is in fact the most exposed. And yet we do not have a collective pan-Asian diplomatic, trade, economic, uh, or, or a subsidy kind of policy that really enables the uh, spread of tech, uh, of climate adaptation technology around the region. We have very wealthy climate tech innovators, places like Japan, like China and others, but most of the region, of course, lags very far behind in adaptation. So this is one area of Asian diplomacy that would benefit significantly 
from greater integration uh, across the technology sphere, the academic sphere, the trades policy sphere, uh, industrial policy coordination, all of those kinds of things. And of course, the collective fate of this ever more integrated Asian economy does depend on that. We're certainly asked, Parag, um, in this G1 Global to focus not just on ideas and uh, concepts, but to look at proposals. And I think you've just given us one, this, uh, this idea of a um, comprehensive Asian climate change policy around uh, adaptation. And it sounds like there's, uh, with the COP meeting coming up, there's a, there's a forum to begin to discuss that as well, but something we should all be aware about. Um, in terms of um, Marcella's point around uh, no one left behind, I mean, I think that's perhaps not just an issue when it comes to um, domestically in Indonesia. Perhaps that's also something on, on the minds of our um, trade thinkers and architects um, that we have in the room today. And I was just wondering if um, Yoshida-san and, and Peter, whether you'd be um, prepared to sort of comment on how you think about, um, I guess, the shadow side of trade, whether it's around labour um, and some of the fallout that happens from, um, I guess, the creative destruction of um, normal capital, you know, capitalist processes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I try to be uh, uh, short, but uh, I I would like to uh, introduce one, uh, you know, uh, way of uh, looking at the uh, evolution of uh, global trade or the globalization. Uh, in the past, old old days, uh, the uh, you know international uh, division of labor uh, has been uh, carried out uh, on the basis of uh, industry by industry, and then it it have evolved into uh, uh, trade, uh, finished goods, and um, you know uh, materials and parts and intermediate goods. And the also, um, you know, uh, now uh, we have more and more uh, integrated economy so that the, uh, you know, division of labor happens on the basis of tasks by tasks. In that sense, um, that happens in, especially in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian countries does not necessarily have the full set of industries to uh, take off its economy. But by having a particular part of the uh, you know, production process, they can uh, get benefit of uh, taking their competitive advantage in that sense. And then uh, you know, specification, specialization um, matters in many aspects of the uh, you know, advanced uh, technology. So that uh, uh, more and more, uh, you know, advanced uh, industries have spun out of the uh, traditional industry. Uh, we talked about the silicon uh, or semiconductor industry this morning. Um, semiconductor industry has uh, R and D, design, testing, and production foundry, et cetera, et cetera. So it has been integrated in the single industry, but now we have uh, those specialized uh, you know, sector within the uh, silicon uh, industry. By looking at that, um, you know, uh, the many uh, developing countries could have, uh, could find the uh, way they can compete in the global economy. But at the same time, in the old days, uh, you know, by losing the, some competitiveness in a, of a particular industry, the country would find another industry to compete in the global, uh, in the international uh, trade. In in that uh, case, the uh, you know uh, different uh, tiers of uh, labor, low skilled, middle, and and high uh, skilled labor can find the similar job, not in the same industry, but in the different industry. But now the international uh, division of labor happens in in terms of the tasks, what happens is, uh, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, you know uh, low skilled um, labor or low low, sk low skilled uh, labor intensive part of the production, uh, you know, uh, eliminated or 
or diminished in a, you know, particularly in the developed uh, countries. So that the uh, you know political uh, division happens, income inequality happens, uh, many uh, kind of issues uh, talked uh, in this uh, G1 Global can be uh, greatly part, part greatly uh, due to this kind of evolvement of the globalization. So that's uh, so. Answering to Anton's question, I think the uh, no one's left behind. Uh, can be uh, made possible by pursuing the integrated uh, globalized uh, economy, but also we need to think thoroughly about the uh, you know, impact of this uh, movement, uh, politically, economy, and soci socially. That's what I'd like to uh, touch upon. Thank you. Thank you, Yosu-san. Peter, you've, you've been involved in um, ambassadorial roles um, around the region prior to your deputy head of mission role um, at the embassy here. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, labour issues when it comes to... Well, I was just going to mention on uh, Marcel's point and your point first on nobody being left behind. And I was really taken by what Marcella said about, you know, young people, the, the number of young people in Indonesia and how they're jumping straight to technologies and everything's changing so fast. And it did make me, it made me reflect, you know, when you think of nobody left behind when we talk about technology, I, I'm worried I'm going to be the one that left, that's left behind, right? I'm the, I'm old. Um, and that's a problem, uh, not, well, you know, not for me, don't worry about me, but it's a problem when the people who are sitting around in rooms negotiating trade agreements are probably, you know, my age uh, uh, or, or, or older. Or, and I look at a lot of our trade agreements and, sure, we're, we're trying to adjust, but a lot of them look quite similar, quite similar to a trade agreement 20, 20, 30 years ago. And the, the pace of change, the new technologies, the new way the world is operating um, is coming at us fast and I'm not sure that our architecture is, is keeping up. So, so going to this notion around generative innovation that we're being asked to look at for the, for the conference today, <laughs> how, how do we make sure that the trade agreements have, have the relevance th um, that they need for the future, um, given what you just said about the negotiators of these trade agreements? Well, I wasn't casting aspersions about all negotiators of trade agreements. I'm sure there's, there's an awful lot. There's an awful lot there. But uh, I, I do think we have to really think about how we keep up um, with, with the world. Um, and change is coming that uh, as much as we try to constrain it, um, w w w I think we've got a real challenge in, in keeping international architecture. It's not just trade. Uh, across the board, up with a very rapidly changing world. I don't have a, I don't have a perfect answer. Maybe Yoshi has a great answer, or, or Dr. Paran. <laughs> or do, do you both mind um, quickly co commenting on on the idea of um, there are there being regional trade agreements, but there are also um, so you know R RCEP and um, CPTPP, um, but we're also seeing um, the you know, strengthening of agreements between India and Europe. Um, we've got um, the US uh, leading the um, international partnership, uh, Indo-Pacific part, um, partnership economic, uh, I, I, IPF, I think it is, yeah. Um, how do these um, external kind of um, trade dynamics and agreements um, impact uh, what, what the Indo-Pacific is developing itself? Um, so, I mentioned three dimensions um, in the beginning. So, in, in the first part, uh, to have free and an open uh, trade in the region, um, the, the RCEP in general, uh, especially for Japan, Japan does not have the trade agreement with uh, Korea and China before RCEP. So, that uh, this is the first agreement to, uh, you know, realize the uh, duty-free uh, trade with those two countries, uh, especially for Japan. So this is kind of the initiative to have uh, free and op open uh, uh, trade in the region. But also, uh, as I mentioned, the CPTPP and other initiatives, um, uh, recently the IPF in particular, this is the initiative to, to pursue the uh, you know, like-minded countries 
uh, initiative to pursue higher standard of uh, trade rules and the uh, more uh, resilient uh, in cope with the uh, un, uh, ex un, uh, you know, uh, expected uh, conse uh, consequences of the uh, initiative taken by other countries. Uh, those are the uh, you know uh, regional uh, trade agreement to be functioning in in face of these issues. Thank you. Well, I, I think the dynamics between trade agreements are really are really interesting. I, I I was a when I did trade agreements, I was a bilateral trade negotiator. So I was there at the conclusion of uh, Australia's free trade agreements with Korea, Japan, and China which we all did in about a year and a half. Those negotiations have been going on for a long time, some of them. But we brought them all to conclusion uh, around 2013, 2015. In a year and a half, we concluded those three free trade agreements. Nearly, nearly killed us. It was just so much work. At the same time, TPP negotiations uh, were, were, were heating up. But, um, and, and sometimes we have business uh, complaining about the complexity of having a range of trade agreements, and I think that's a that is a valid point. Uh, but I also believe that a, a rising tide lifts all boats, and you can see the uh, competitive tensions between trade agreements ramping up ambition. Australia is a trading country; Australia depends on trade, um, and so I could see across all of those agreements how they helped raise the raise the ambition for each agreement. So we concluded the Korea trade agreement first. You know, it was a great deal for Korea on cars. That made a Japan more interested on cars. Uh, we concluded uh, the tri free trade agreement with Japan. Um, that, you know, was uh, some breakthroughs on agriculture with Japan. It was as Japan was negotiating in those days with the US and the TPP. So it changed the dynamics of the, of the negotiations in the TPP. So I believe you know, sometimes it can, be, it can look a bit messy. But uh, as a pragmatic trading nation, um, these the variety of us architecture can help um, increase uh, increase ambition. And and I guess is there's a there's a difference between the, the the competitiveness towards efficiency in these agreements versus, say, some of the values based um, discussion around labour and environment and some of the green technology issues you brought, you brought up too, Peter. Yes, I think that's right, and it's a per perennial debate on, and you'll see different trade agreements deal with labour and environment, uh, human rights issues in different ways. So it's a perennial debate about how much to include these in trade agreements. You'll see different different countries taking different approaches, um, and even you know uh, different regional agreements as well, being able to do more or less on some of those uh, cross-cutting value-based issues. Um. But we're, we're about to go to questions, so please prime a couple of questions to, to give to all, um, any of the panellists you wish. Um, but Parag, you advise um, businesses um, all, over, all over the region. Um, you talked about the, the um, issue around economic complexity and sophistication, and we've also spoken about um, the transformation of production processes um, in terms of just um, evolution of economics. What, 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 what advice do you give businesses as we're here trying to connect um, knowledge of trade uh, with people trying to um, do, do trade in the region? Um, what, what, are you, what are your um, key pointers to CEOs here? Well, the, the general principle at play around the world is to sort of, you know, make where you sell more and more. And this is maybe a bit paradoxical. On the one hand, we have global trade interconnectedness, but because of industrial policies, there's definitely a home market bias. Uh, this has a lot to do with everything from cost arbitrage to domestic competition. The more domestic competition you have emerging from the very strong technology players, retailers, technology vendors as well, even in uh, bo both developed and developing markets, the more you have to, quote unquote, make where you sell. You have to be in those markets, understand the tastes and the preferences and compete with those local uh, incumbents or, or startups. So making where you sell is really a un becoming a universal law almost. Now, just look at how this is playing out uh, in the world or, or how this intersects 
with supply chain diversification, because for many years, Apple said, well, we can't possibly manufacture iPhones in India. Look at the low quality of the domestic production base. They don't make, you know, the high quality components that Apple needs. Well, lo and behold, you now have uh, iPhones being made in India. Uh, we would have said the same thing about semiconductors for a long time. But now if you look at the growth in uh, semiconductor production, you see it happening again, even in uh, developing or middle income uh, Asian countries, you see this in India, in Vietnam, uh, and elsewhere. So even with uh, high tech goods like semiconductors, you're seeing that diversification. And of course, those are growing markets for the production itself of those same uh, components or products. So there is really a make where you sell effect going on. And I think that's overall a positive trend. That's one of the, the number one lessons that I would give to, to multinationals. The other, again, is the supply chain diversification resilience as a virtue in its own right, because you really have to be concerned about geopolitical issues, trade-related uh, issues and policy, and climate risk and issues as well. If you take all those three things into account, whether you're looking at uh, semiconductors or other categories of, of goods, you really want to make sure that you're not exposed to a single point of failure. And that's why we have this rush to diversify uh, semiconductor production away from that single point of failure of Taiwan. And I think overall, quite frankly, even though if it even though it reduces the the um, the edge that some markets have had in some categories, uh, overall, it leads to a much more resilient system because it means that you have more ways for uh, supply to meet demand. Thanks, Prague. Good strategic advice. Do we have a couple of questions we can take? I'm happy to take one, uh, two or three and then we can um, and, and say who you'd like to direct them to as well. Please. So just, just speak each of your questions. And if we have any online, do we have any other online questions? No online questions? Okay. Uh, Tessitors, I have a question to Yoshi san and Peter. Uh, the international trade has led the growth globally, but the international system is under attack. Uh, the first question is how can you revitalize WTO to b b make it more relevant? And the more specific question is that, especially from the environment concern, the trade policy has been under attack through the CBAM by EU and IRA by the US. So these are inconsistent with at least the spirit of, of the uh, international trade policies. So how can you deal with these kind of challenges from both of you? So let's take that question and, and the question behind and then um, we'll, if you can, you each might want to respond to that. Oh uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my question is for I think, uh, I think all of you. Uh, uh, I want to ask how do you see Quad and BRICS in today's world and its relevance to realize Asia's dreams? That was quad, quad and BRICS. Because India is a member of both the uh, Qu both so both the quadri sections. quadrilateral security dialogue. Quad and, yeah, and quadrilateral between and yeah, that's right. Thank you. So it's the quad India Australia oh that one yeah you know all right. So w w let's let's go with those two Happy questions. Do you, do you want to? Peter? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, as I mentioned, um, WTO has three functions. One is rule making and the uh, dispute settlement and monitoring. Those three functions are weakened significantly. And the, uh, the, on the rule making, uh, one way is to, to use the uh, you know, FTA, EPA approach. And also, uh, we, we may seek the uh, you know, non-consensus-based rule-making. WTO is consensus-based. That's why the, uh, you know, any uh, you know, initiatives the, or the uh, negotiated outcomes could be uh, beaded by any uh, member of the WTO. So that we, we could uh, you know, uh, discuss the way to uh, form the um, you know uh, the uh, rules, uh, not necessarily um, uh, you know um, uh, uh, binds uh, all the member country, but the uh, you know uh, uh, option to be part of the agreement. That's that's the way. And dispute settlement 
MPIA, so-called, uh, is, is a way we are seeking. And also, US is showing their willingness to think about the way uh, let the WTO dispute settlement function um, in some way so that uh, we, we would hope uh, that uh, we could have a, a you know, positive, constructive uh, discussion on that point. And also, the monitoring is, is something we need to strengthen as well. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the CBAM and the uh, IRA initiatives. Basically, the uh, you know we have some sort of uh, discipline on subsidies and and other uh, you know market intervention, and also uh, we 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 have uh, exception uh, based on the uh, national security in the WTO rule. Uh, national security uh, is something uh, that you know uh, the members of the WTO have not. Elaborated in a, an, uh, in a uh, you know uh, needed way, so that uh, uh, we need to uh, find a solution in terms of you know how how we can uh, tackle the issue related to national uh, security in in uh, in considering the uh, consistency with the WTO or the multilateral rule trading rule. That's that I think the basic uh, uh, thoughts we have in this moment. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, so we'll do the WTO first, uh, which I think uh, yoshida san is much more expert than I. Uh, but um, uh, Australia and Japan actually are both working together very closely to reform the WTO, as many other countries are as well. We know there has to be work there. Uh, like Japan, Australia is, uh, participates in the MPIA, which is a uh, dispute uh, settlement process. Um, and we've we, we use that to, to try to meet, uh, address disputes while uh, other reform is underway. Uh, but uh, this has got to be an ongoing process. Uh, and it's the WTO, but it's also what sort of rules we can pursue um, elsewhere um, and promote the trading norms uh, for countries that aren't superpowers, you know, the countries that are, you know, we, we'd say we're a large trading country, but nation, but we're not one of the largest countries in the world. We rely on norms and rules to secure uh, secure our, our trade, and I think that applies for all the countries um, in Southeast Asia and, and so forth as well, so it, it's crucial. Um, on, on, on the environmental changes, I think we're going to see lots of um, policies, domestic policies and international policies introduced by a range of countries as everybody moves in this you know, huge uh, transition. Um, and so I think that's when you know, close partnership is more important than ever. Uh, creating resilience together, looking at the opportunities uh, to, to develop um, partnerships. Uh, you know, Japan and Australia for instance, recently did a critical minerals working group. So we've got to look at how we can cooperate together uh, to support energy security uh, and um, and that decarbonisation task. Um, I'll do the, the quarters as well, if you like, um, and then I'll be quiet. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a very very interesting body bringing together those four 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 countries. Uh, it's not pure. It's, it's, it doesn't have a huge trade focus, but I think there's a big exciting role for the Quad in supporting. Uh, emerging technologies, so there's work on emerging technologies, there's work on, on critical technologies and supply chains. And when you have, you know, four crucial countries like that working together, you can actually make a difference. So I think there is, a, um, you know, huge opportunities there. Um, are there any other questions at the moment? Because we've got five minutes to run. Um, Yasu-san is going to um, re respond further to this question, but I just want to make sure that we're getting all the questions um, from the floor um, to sort of round out this discussion. And, uh, do we have another couple? We do. And uh, is there another one, one or two questions? OK, so we have th this one here. Before, before you ask the question, um, I'll ask Yasu-san to respond. Yasu-san, did you want to say something to the previous um, question? Or? Okay, just just um, respond to the question about uh, uh, Quad. Uh, in the context of Quad, uh, the four countries are pursuing the uh, promotion of the quality infrastru infrastructure. 
uh, we, we need to think about the you know, lifetime cost of the infrastructure and, and the constellation of the environmental impact of the infrastructure. Those are the things we, we need to uh, take into consideration. We uh, think about the installment of the infrastructure in the region. That that's ca those kind of things are uh, within the discussion among uh, quote countries, so that uh, we count on quote to uh, work on these important issues in the economic front. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we'll take this question over here. Yes, please. Um, I have a question to both of you, and. Um, uh, it is about uh, how to design the policy making, uh, particularly um, what is the expected leadership when you uh, design the um, scheme of the economic partnership. And the, when we say the, the other govern government, so Japanese government and Australian government, so would, it, would you think it would be the same or different? Yeah, well, um, I'll be very quick because somebody's holding a two-minute sign at me. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, Australia and Japan has never been more aligned than now on strategic issues. Um, and so um, what it is is uh, translating that and showing vision uh, to work together. I think things have got much more, you know, the whole world is much more complicated now. So leadership now is actually about talking to each other and bringing each other along on the journey, which I think is what we're trying to do. That's it. That's it. Well, um, we, we, do, we do have time for um, another quick comment. We're, we're almost out of time for the session. Um, but I'd, I'd like um, each of the speakers to um, leave us with one final thought. Um, if it's a proposal around trade policy um, um, in terms of ideas or something that businesses should look at in terms of trade or something that states can do, um, please leave us with your final thought and um, we'll probably have 20 seconds each for that okay um so maybe the uh you know resilience and the uh uh you know um, um how can i say uh, resilience is the emerging uh policy um topic uh for many countries and uh, we are trying to do our best to address this issue so that uh, uh i think that the uh, you know, uh, capability of adaptation to the changing environment for the private business is uh, pretty much important in in recent years. That's uh, kind of the uh, uh, you know message or proposal I would like to put forward in this panel. Thank, thank you, you yes, sir. Uh, Marcella, would you like to go? Yes, thank you. 20 seconds. Interesting. I think I would like to speak on behalf of tax sectors yeah, in, in terms of international trade and how technology has affected international trade. I think in the future, we need to be mindful that countries are now being borderless. Demand and services are, 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 are being uh, exchanged seamlessly. Even maybe fiat, uh, fiat currency exchange is, is irrelevant anymore. So I think this this is my proposal for, for everyone who are in now in a trade agreement that at, I think everyone who are now drafting agreements between country or regulating international trade is to be mindful on that, on that fact and to be able to project what is in the future, so what is convenience to the countries and also to the businesses in terms of um, trading on um, surfaces, a good end surfaces. So a, a, a sort of a, a grand inclusiveness, we've, we've had resilience. Um, Parag, your, your final comment? Well, I would uh, end where I began, which is that we should endeavor to keep the geopolitics and geoeconomics as uh, di you know distinct and discrete as possible. Of course, we are in an age of rivalry, of competition, but markets, societies always benefit when they can have the best technology at the most competitive price. And competition and the regional uh, division of labor and innovation that is flourishing in Asia, unlocking that and allowing that to penetrate as widely and deeply across uh, Asian society as possible is going to be the thing that, you know, eventually that benefits uh, the region the most and keeps the momentum going. Thanks, Parag. Peter, any final words? 
Well, I, I was just uh, reflecting on trade agreements and trade agreements at their heart are about uh, making trade happen. Uh, it's about liberalising. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind. As we work in a more complicated world, we have to keep uh, delivering arrangements that can help cooperation, can help new technologies, can uh, pa pave the way for uh, greater involvement across the board. Th thank, thanks very much, Peter. And thank you, um, Yasir San. Thank you, um, Parag. Thank you, Marcella. Um, it's been a fascinating and very wide-ranging conversation. Um, we've looked at a range of topics. And I think, you know, from the idealism that um, you both espouse in terms of um, the trade policy um, work that you do, um, but also the, the realism that everyone's talked about here today and a, a sophisticated going forward of, of trade and globalisation. I think it's been a great discussion. Hope you've all enjoyed it and benefited and learned something. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank <laughs> you.